Hello. I think I think we're I think we've begun. Um, this is uh, John Jeremiah Sullivan in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, I'm a I'm a writer, mainly for the New York Times Magazine, and I'm honored to be here tonight uh, for what I think is going to be a really um, fascinating conversation with Dr. Richard Yarbrough and Dr. Helena, uh, Helena Spencer, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm here partly representing Third Person Project, which is um, an historical um, research initiative here in Wilmington focused on, um, on the Black history of, of the region, much of which is, is still quite obscure. And, um, and, and I'm also semi-representing the Equity Institute at UNCW, which is a new um, a new initiative for for community engagement that I think is going is is going to have some very um, positive influence here in here in the city. Uh, so I so I'm going to introduce Helena and and she'll introduce Dr. Yarborough. Helena Kopchik Spencer is associate professor of music history and bassoon in the Department of Music at UNCW. She is also affiliated faculty in women's and gender studies. She's published essays and presented conference papers on 19th century French opera and ballet. She is also a regular guest lecturer for these. Her current research in progress is on Katerina Yarborough focusing on her Wilmington recitals and her European career. The recipient of an 1898 Legacies and Futures Curriculum Development Grant. This coming fall, she'll teach a special section of the course Women in Music, focusing on Black women singers with ties to Wilmington before and after 1898. So um, her work is very much at the heart of, of what we're trying to do to um, to recover uh, some of these lives, um, artistic lives that, that grew out of the black culture and history of, of Wilmington. Um, having worked with Helena some in, in the past couple of months, I can say that she is a, a, a brilliant and generous person. And, um, and I will, uh, I'll turn it over to her now. Thanks so much, uh, John, for that really generous introduction. Um, it's my honor now to introduce um, our distinguished guest, Dr. Richard Yarborough. Um, I, I don't know if some of you, I think, may have um, remembered him from some of his past visits to campus, and we're, we're hoping to be able to have him back to campus um, live and in person when, uh, when it's safe to do so. Um, I believe his first visit to the UNCW or to Wilmington um, was for a conference on 1898 um, and its legacies um, back in, in the late 90s. And um, then most recently um, in my time at UNCW, my colleague, uh, Dr. Nancy King, uh, with the Department of Music and Opera Wilmington invited Dr. Richard Yarborough uh, to be our keynote speaker for our 2018 Opera Wilmington Exploring Opera Symposium, um, honoring and celebrating um, the legacy of his aunt Katrina Yarborough. Um, and so I, I'm just delighted, really honored to be able to introduce him to you and he'll have some um, introductory remarks. Um, Dr. Yarbrough is professor in the departments of English and African American Studies at UCLA. Um, he teaches and conducts research on a wide range of issues related to African American literature and US literature and culture more broadly. Um, he's the recipient of numerous awards. Um, I'm just gonna name a few. Uh, the 2016 Darwin T. Turner Distinguished Scholar Award for Outstanding Contributions to African American Literary Study. Um, the 2012 inaugural Richard A. Yarbrough Award in Mentoring from the American Studies Association, and that award, of course, is named in his honor. Um, in 2014, UCLA Academic Senate's Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Award, um, Distinguished Teaching Award from UCLA, and Commendations from the City of Los Angeles and the County of Los Angeles. 
among his many publications. Um, I'm just going to name one in, in it in that it's so germane to this current UNCW initiative um, on 1898 and its legacies. Um, he has the article, Violence, Manhood, and Black Heroism, The Wilmington Riot in Two Turn-of-the-Century African-American Novels, and that's in the edited volume, Democracy Betrayed, The Wilmington Race Riot of 1898 and Its Legacy, published by University of North Carolina Press in 1998. Um, so without further ado, um, it's our honor to have with us tonight, Dr. Richard Yarborough. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your comments. Um, I uh, want to thank uh, John Sullivan for reaching out to me, I guess a couple of months ago now and inviting me to participate in, in what looks like a really great series, a really great initiative. Um, and I very much look forward to my conversation um, with uh, John and Alina. Um, and I, I too regret that we can't have this discussion in, 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 in person. Um, I've taught online for a year now, and I can tell you that um, I'm sure most of you know that Zoom fatigue is a very real thing. Um, so I, uh, I look forward to my next visit to Wilmington. Um, I was hoping that it would be this, but it will, it will be the next time. Um, I thought it would be useful for me to um, provide some brief uh, introductory comments uh, about my engagement um, in, in research um, into Wilmington history, um, uh, because I think uh, it evolved along a couple of lines that I would not have predicted uh, would intersect. Um, I was born in Philadelphia um, and raised in the Philadelphia suburbs. Um, and if you had asked me when I was growing up uh, about Wilmington, um, I would have assumed you were talking about the city in Delaware uh, that was about half an hour away from my house. And I, all I knew is that folks went there when they didn't want to pay uh, Pennsylvania sales tax uh, on their alcohol. Um, I don't think that I even became aware of Wilmington, North Carolina until I was in graduate school. Um, my doctoral dissertation was on 19th century African-American fiction, uh, which led me to the work of Charles Chestnut. Um, uh, who spent uh, a lot of time in North Carolina and, and uh, a lot of his writing focuses on North Carolina. I was especially intrigued by his um, fictional rendering um, of the 1898 Wilmington riot in a novel called The Marrow of Tradition, uh, a book that has uh, been receiving more and more attention um, over the past um, decade or two. Um, uh, that novel was published in 1901. Um, I also came across a second novel by a Black writer of dealing with Wilmington and the um, tragedy in Wilmington 1898, and that was um, Hanover or the Persecution of the Lowly, um, the Black Wilmington writer, David Fulton. He had moved out of Wilmington, but he had uh, strong ties, and that book also came out around the same time. Um, um, clearly, uh, something was going on in Wilmington and something about this event um, was, um, uh, imp had such a powerful impact on the African-American community, both locally and nationally, that these two writers felt driven to um, turn to fiction to engage the, the controversial uh, uh, and traumatic uh, 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 upheaval. Um, in my research, I also felt that I should be reading the anti-Black um, fiction produced by white Southern writers during that period um, as well. And, you know, many of you may know of the writer Thomas Dixon, who wrote um, in the infamous novel, The Klansman, um, a celebration of the Ku Klux Klan. And that was the basis of the very famous film, Birth of a Nation, by the um, um, uh, pioneering uh, filmmaker D.W. Griffith. Equally disturbing um, is Dixon's novel called The Leopard Spots, which is his version of the Wilmington riot. Um, not surprisingly, he presents the events as fully justified and a manifestation of the inevitable triumph of white supremacy. Um, reading those, just those three novels, not to mention all of the contemporaneous journalism and some of the books that have been written, uh, especially from the Southern point of view, a Southern white point of view about the event, made it clear that the Wilmington riot was a monumental uh, 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 and an explosive um, and controversial series of, of events that really changed the shape of the city and of the state 
um, and really um, laid the ground for uh, developments throughout the South. Um, the importance of the event was indisputable, and yet I hadn't heard anything about it, um, and I hadn't read much about it. Um, the groundbreaking opera singer Katerina Jarborough, my father's aunt, my own great aunt, um, she was a compelling presence in my um, childhood and teenage years, and I use compelling in quotation marks with the italics um, and underlined. Um, Aunt Catherine, as we called her, she lived in New York City at the time, um, but she would come sweeping magisterially into our lives um, periodically without warning. Um, she would call my father from the train station from, um, I think it may, must have been 30th Street in, in Pennsylvania. She wouldn't call from New York, she'd call from Philadelphia and say, come pick me up. Um, she wasn't shy at all about talking about her time in Europe. Um, she loved dropping names, um, talked about the, especially the black celebrities um, with whom she was familiar. Uh, she also had a lot to say about the younger generation not appreciating her and her accomplishments. Um, she felt in particular that Marian Anderson was getting some attention as a pioneer that she should have gotten. Um, in contrast, however, as far as I can recall, she never mentioned her childhood. She never mentioned her upbringing. She never mentioned Wilmington. Um, that gap, that absence didn't strike me as odd when I was growing up. I mean, if you had asked me where I thought she was from, I would have said New York. Um, that seemed to be the center of her world and with, of course, the connections to Europe. It was as if Aunt Catherine uh, exploded on the music scene fully formed. Um, as if she was completely a product of her own imagination and talent. She just self, completely self-created. I'm not sure exactly when I realized that she'd been born and raised in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, coincidentally, I think it dated around the time that I was first encountering the work of Charles Chestnut and David Fulton in graduate school. This would have been in the mid seventies. I actually have a commemorative booklet titled A Short History of the Fine Arts that was published by the Wilmington New Hanover County American Revolution Bicentennial Commission, uh, dated April 1976. And either my father gave that to me or Aunt Catherine sent it to me directly. Um, the booklet featured three black artists who were born in Wilmington, uh, Frederick Cornelius Austin Sr., Caroline Sedgwer Manley, who actually was related to Alexander Manley, the editor, um, and third, Katerina Jarbro. Although the connection between the research I was then doing um, on the Wilmington riot, because of my interest in Chestnut and Fulton, uh, it, you know, although that, the connection between that research on one hand and my growing interest in my great aunt's life and time in Wilmington, on the other hand, looking back, that connection should have been obvious to me. Um, you know, she, you know, if I had just looked at the dates, um, but it took a while for it to sink in that my great grandfather's family resided in Wilmington during the riot. And in fact, the house where he was living, where Kat Katerina was born and raised, um, that house is still there. It's a, it's a historic, has a historical plaque on it now. I think um, one reason why the history of my family's, my father's family in Wilmington seemed somehow separate from what I was learning about the Wilmington riot and about the fiction based on that riot was that I never heard anyone mention Wilmington, North Carolina when I was growing up, much less anyone mention the traumatic events that took place there in 1898. Aunt Katrina never mentioned it, nor did her siblings, um, Eliza and Joe, um, both of whom lived well into their 90s um, and both of whom I got to know, uh, including as a young adult. Um, the three of them never mentioned uh, well, their time in Wilmington or the riot. My father, who loved telling stories, um, he never mentioned it. Um, and I also don't remember my father talking about his grandfather, who would have been John W. Yarborough, the first uh, Katerina's father. Um, so the silence uh, in, in the family, which again, didn't strike me as odd, um, it, it didn't uh, compel me to pursue uh, what looking back would have been some obvious linkages. Um, the puzzle pieces began to fall into place in the mid eighties for me. Um, and that's actually um, when I made my first trip to Wilmington back in the 1980s. 
Um, and I spent, I uh, was doing a research trip in North Carolina and I spent, I think, a, a really filled day in Wilmington. I don't remember staying there overnight. Um, that's when I first saw the Yarborough House. Um, I think it had been dedicated like around 1981. Um, I remember just sitting across the street in the rental car, staring at it, trying to decide, was I gonna go up and knock on the door and see if the people who were living there had any interest in letting me in? And I, I did not, uh, but I did take pictures. Um, that was the birthplace, of course, of, of uh, Katerina Yarborough. Um, that same day, I went from the house to the office of the Wilmington Journal, uh, where the editor, Thomas Gervais, was gracious enough to speak to me. I gave him no heads up I was coming. I just walked in. Um, and across the street, as I knew, was the site where the offices of Alexander Manley's Wilmington record had stood um, before being burned in the early stage of the riot. That was my second stop. Uh, my final stop was in the New Hanover County Public Library. And I um, skim was skimming through issues of the Wilmington Messenger uh, that appeared in the days following the upheaval in November of 1898. And um, I had read a lot about the events leading to the riot. I decided, um, let me take some time and look at how the newspapers locally covered the, um, the, the, the days in the wake of the riot. And the article that caught my eye described the inquest committee um, that uh, had just been convened by the new illegally installed city government um, to allegedly investigate the violence. It was clear to me that the, it was a rubber stamp there was going to be no serious investigation. And my assumption was that that group, the inquest committee, would consist um, exclusively of white members of the community uh, who were allied with the coup. Um, imagine my shock when I saw the name John W. Yarborough um, at the end of the list of six committee members. And it turns out there were two African-American committee members, and I'm presuming that their names came last in the list, um, and four white members. Um, as I mentioned, this was when the pieces um, began to fall into place, the connection between my research into Wilmington riot and my connection um, into uh, my research into my own family. Um, this intersection between my family history and the story of the riot brought everything into sudden focus for me at that time. And again, this is the mid 80s, and I've learned so much more about uh, both my aunt and about the, 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 the events in 1898 since then. Um, it also raised a slew of questions, the answers to which I may never learn. What was John W. Yarbrough's position in the local black community? Uh, what were his relations with the leading whites in the city? When the violence in Wilmington broke out in November of 1898, John W. Yarbrough and his wife, Eliza, had three children in the house. They were aged approximately two, seven, and 10 years of age. Um, a number of sources indicate that my aunt Katrina was born in July of 1898. If in fact that date is accurate, that means that my great grandfather and his wife had a newborn infant, Katrina Jarborough, in the house at the same time. In other words, three or four months after this infant had been born, the riot broke out. The Wilmington riot off record office that was attacked and burned on November 10th, 1898, it was only six blocks from the Yarborough house. Um, what could they have heard? Um, the fire, uh, uh, the black fire company that went to try to put the flames out. Um, people talk about hearing the bell. Um, could gunshots have been heard? Uh, was the fire noise from the fire engine, uh, fire truck, horse drawn? Could that have been heard? What had to be going through their minds when the city exploded in violence? What choices did John Yarborough make to safeguard his family, including the newborn Aunt Katrina. What conversations were going on in the house during that terrifying time? How did they interact with their children? Needless to say, what had been to me to that point, a somewhat abstract series of historical events, all of a sudden became personally very, very real. And uh, I still have that um, um, sense whenever I think about those events. In other words, my family history on my father's side, Aunt Katrina's side, that's now inextricably linked to the history of the Wilmington riot in 1898. And the more I learn about what happened in that city, um, the more textured and nuanced a sense of the conditions confronting my great grandfather's family uh, uh, become to me, the more uh, uh, intense of a sense I gain. 
Um, I've just recently read the book Willington's Lie by David uh, Ducino, and it was as if my great grandfather was a shadowy, indistinct, indistinct presence on every page. Um, ironically, that the author never mentions John Yarbrough's name when he talks about the inquest committee made my reading of that history of the event even more unsettling. I'll end by suggesting that this may be where the creative arts come in. Um, over the past decade or so, a number of scholars have sought to address a, a crucial question about their research. How can we engage important African-American historical experiences when the usual resources to which we turn for information are lacking? In other words, how do we come to terms with um, the, historic, the history of African-Americans when in some cases the archives are scanty or even non-existent? If you look back at the, the allegedly documentary um, uh, uh, material about the Wilmington riot that was produced, say, in the first 30, 40, 50 years, with rare exception, it was produced by um, individuals who had a vested interest in rationalizing and justifying the events. Um, what about all the other voices, all the other perspectives? Um, we simply don't have them in the same form and in the same density um, as, as we would like. But what my point here is, is that while fictional works like the novels of by Chestnut and David Fulton, they may not fill in the historical record in terms of the factual data that you might be looking for, but they can definitely help us come to terms with events by dramatizing the psychological complex humanity of the victims, a humanity that the racial violence was intended to deny. Understanding the experiences of African-Americans in Wilmington, both before and after the events of 1898 will enhance an appreciation of this humanity that I'm, I'm talking about, a very contested black humanity. And it will also provide us with a fuller, more balanced, and I would argue even inspiring appreciation of what it took for that community, not just to survive, but ultimately to thrive. Um, let me stop there and we can dive into conversation. And I, again, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to visit, even if virtually. Thank you so much, Dr. Yarbrough. And my understanding is that um, if anyone who is tuning in, uh, you can use the chat function to type questions uh, directly. And um, Joel will be helping us to kind of moderate some of those questions as they come in. Um, I'm going to start with something that's maybe it's broad. It's not specific to uh, Katerina Yarbrough, but um, you've obviously you've been doing research on the Wilmington massacre for decades now, and but but it seems as though only just now, you know, you know, in widespread. Um, popular culture is there is there coming to be an interest in 1898 and um and it's you know it's only now that in in um various various outlets there's you know it's about like here's this this coup d'etat that you never knew about um why do you think that wilmington and um and the massacre of 1898 are getting so much attention right now in this moment yeah um i mean it's a really good question and um the thing that struck me, uh, particularly in reading the last um, uh, a popular history um, that I mentioned, Wilmington's Lie, because that's not a, I mean, it, it, it draws upon scholarly research, but it's not a, a written for scholars. I mean, it's written for a trade popular audience, um, is that I think um, without being overly sanguine and optimistic, I think conversations have changed about race and racial history over the past decade. And in some ways that, to be frank, um, have surprised me. Um, you know, I don't think, I'm not sure if I would even use the term tipping point, but for example, if you had told me, I have, my mother's living currently in Richmond and so is my sister. And I'll, if you've been there, you have gone up and down Monument uh, Boulevard or Avenue where the statues of Confederate heroes are. And if you had told me that the conversations we're now having about memorials, um, to the Confederacy, about the flag, um, some of the changes that we have seen about mascot names. If you had told me 15, 20 years ago that we would be having those conversations right now and some people would be changing 
uh, how they thought about their identity in terms of region, in terms of uh, nationalism, in terms of race, I'm not sure I would have believed you. I think that there are conversations happening now that weren't happening before. I also think that there has been um, a, um, it's been painful and we aren't finished obviously, but there's been a more direct confrontation with some of the brutal um, and um, disturbing uh, legacy of racial violence in the United States. Some of that is, I think, tied to the conversations we're having now uh, about you know, Black Lives Matter. Um, um, I think the documentation uh, is both of contemporaneous ongoing racial violence is becoming more unavoidable, but I think historical resources um, have become available, especially the digitization of say um, um, uh, uh, obscure newspapers and people's papers. Um, family members are um, recognizing that they may have um, items, magazines, newspapers, clippings that um, are important and are sharing them. Archival uh, uh, outreach is taking place. Um, and I think just maybe in terms of the popular culture, um, uh, I, I'm a big science fiction fan and I was fascinated by the uh, series last year, uh, Watchmen. And the opening episode of Watchmen is a, an amazing and difficult to watch, but important reconstruction of the Tulsa race riot. Um, and so when you're starting to see um, real historical events like that show up in the popular media, um, I think it says something about the conversations the culture is ready to have. And I think that's, and it's not just, um, you know, in you know Hollywood, I mean, this is, throughout the country, including in the South, generational change has certainly um, played a role as well. So um, I think it's part of a larger uh, um, um, movement, it may not be the right word phenomenon. Um, and I think it's long overdue. And I think that it is, um, it's a process of everyone becoming uh, more educated about a shared history um, that um, is both, um, uh, like I mentioned, inspiring, but also very sobering. So I think that that strikes, those strike me as some of the things that might be in play. Thank you. Um, we have a question um, from Rich. Uh, why do you think your relatives didn't speak of their time in Wilmington uh, when they were young? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the first thing that strikes me um, when I finally, that struck me when I finally realized that there was this silence was, um, and maybe it's too simple, but the first thing that strikes me is it was too painful. Um, you know, I come from a generation of where, um, at least in my family, but I, I know some of my peers that um, many um, aspiring African-American families, particularly, you know, middle-class families, you know, uh, who were uh, working desperately for their next generation to not go through the experiences that the, they they had gone through. Um, I I have I've had the experience, and, and I've talked to friends who've had the experience where they find out that their parents had been censoring um, what they had been telling the children, um, in a way so that it, the burden of discouragement and the burden of the trauma, um, of course, they wouldn't have been using that language, but you know, to, to keep their, the possibilities open um, without, and, and the burden of history, you know, the fear was that that would foreclose hope. Um, and I, I, my, my parents have did that in other areas as well. So it wasn't just Wilmington. I mean, I, I have found out things um, that maybe looking back, I kind of wish my parents had shared because it would have equipped me um, differently at a certain point in my life, but I understand uh, what their hope was. Um, so I think that there, there may well have been on part of the parents a desire not to have um, the da their children damaged by, especially if the children didn't live through it, damaged by that legacy. Um, but I also think maybe from a more individual psychology, psychological standpoint, um, it was really, it must have been really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, again, I don't know my great grandfather, but, you know, I, I can't imagine that at some level, you know, survival guilt. I mean, you know, the fact that, you know, he, his property, his family were able to stay in Wellington and to survive, um, you know, and this isn't, you know, to, to belie really comp the complexity of the Black Wilmington community. It was not monolithic. 
uh, politically, uh, class-wise, uh, uh, educationally, professionally, but the psychological cost on the entire Black community, the people who suffered losses, the people who left and were driven out, or the people who stayed, had to have been extraordinary. And I, I just, you know, I, I am all, all struck by the, the fact that, you know, members of that community not just stayed, but were able to um, live full lives and to raise children and to raise children who uh, went on to do things like Aunt Katrina did. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I want to, I, I think uh, John Jeremiah may have um, some comments here and, 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 I, and I was thinking of, of uh, you know, reaching out to him too, because, you know, your comments about how the black community was not monolithic in terms of, of politics and class. And um, if you, uh, you know, if you or, or, or John could say more about um, the status of the Yarborough family and John W. Yarborough um, as a barber, what that meant um, in late, in late 19th century Wilmington. John. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, what you were saying, Richard, about um, the, the context that the, that the family found themselves in, I think is really astute um, based on what I, what I know of the situation, which, is, is, um, which comes from having kind of entered it through um, Katerina's father, through J.W. Yarborough, um, who, you know, who was one of the most important uh, barbers in town, and that um, that role, that that occupation, and the social um, legitimacy that came with it is, is such an important factor in in nineteenth century black history. So many of the first black political figures had been barbers um, or uh, craftspeople or or musicians in some cases, jobs that allowed a person to to save some money. Um, so I think I, I get the sense from the old newspapers and, and letters and things that J.W. Yarborough was a real figure in the in the community here, um, and it and it, it really points up what you're saying about the the non monolithic nature of of the black community. Then there was a lot of inner fracturing, and um, and specifically in this case, I remember being really surprised um, but also kind of schooled by by um, finding that that Katarina's father actually was pretty vocal um, before and after the massacre and coup he 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 is speaking out but he's not on the side that we want to find him on he takes a position against the daily record that manly has been too outspoken and he um, he, he sort of it's a Booker T. Washington line in a way. He's saying, um, you know, be cool, don't make any trouble, keep saving money. That's going to be the thing that will make a difference for us. Um, so that's all to say that I've wondered if maybe one of the reasons why um, folks didn't talk about it in, in your family. I mean, I feel sort of ridiculous saying this about your family. I, I don't you know, it's not my place to have an opinion, but I've wondered if it may have had something to do with how um, difficult it would have been to explain that, to explain why grandfather um, seemed to side with the whites after this horrible event, you know, and, and as you mentioned, he had a lot to lose, the baby, um, the, the, the thriving business. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, all that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and um, I realized that, you know, the younger generation of, of, of Blacks in the South, uh, you know, who were coming of age um, during that period, um, many of them participated in, you know, what was known as the Great Migration North. Um, but, uh, you know, it, I always wondered about uh, the fact that Aunt Katrina, uh, Joe, uh, her sister Eliza, Anna, um, all left. And as far as I know, Joe and Eliza did not go back. I know Katrina went back several times. Um, so it, again, it makes you it makes you wonder about the extent to which, um, you know, 
there may not have been conversation um, about it, but uh, these choices and the strain uh, at a psychological level that it places, and especially across generations where children look back at you know, decisions their parents made, I mean, I certainly do in my life, um, and make judgments. Um, but there, was, there, there seemed to have been some alienation from the Wilmington experience on the part of the next generation. Um, uh, but again, you know, a lot of this is just speculative. All we can do is look at the historical context that, that you were describing. Um, and your mention of Booker T. Washington is interesting. I mean, one of the things that I have found out recently, um, it's not directly about John Yarborough, but um, his Katrina, um, one of her music teachers in Wilmington, um, let's see if I have the name, was Nellie Chestnut Taylor. Um, and uh, Nellie Taylor was married to um, uh, Robert Taylor, who I think he's had a postage stamp. I mean, he was uh, Booker T. Washington's one of his uh, right-hand people. He was the architect. He was the first Black graduate from MIT in the 19th century. And he was the architect for many of the buildings at Tuskegee. So, you know, it's a little bit of a attenuated connection, but it certainly seems that the, that the, the circle, the Black middle-class circle in which my, my great-grandfather went and in which Katrina was raised certainly had direct connections to Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee machine. So, you know, your, your comment about Washington's politics, um, you know, his conservatism, it would make sense uh, that, um, you know, uh, uh, John W. Yarborough uh, at least was not adversarial when, and at least was not, uh, did not con uh, uh, reject it. Um, there may have been even closer ties. I, I, I just don't know. Um, so I, I'm, I have not forgotten about Les's question um, in the <laughs> chat because I, I, I do have a lot to say about that. Um, but um, this is this is a question um, from Elena um, asking if you know, in terms of the rest of your extended family, you know, have you had discussions about um, this family history? Do you know have they expressed any? Um, uh, you know, feelings. And Elena, feel free to unmute yourself if you, I think I'm getting your, the gist of your question, but. I could. Uh, yeah, go, I think. Uh, yeah, let me give it a shot. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, I think if Aunt Katrina had um, talked about it, you know, in any fashion, um, it would have been part of um, the family, uh, you know, the, the mythology, family, you know, discussions um, in some kind of way. But um, I think another factor here is that my, I never knew my father's father, who would have been a connection. So I didn't know my paternal grandfather or grandmother. So there was a there was a break there that might have carried back to um, Wilmington. Um, when my father talked about when my family went to visit family members, extended family, um, I remember going to Florida to meet with uh, Aunt Eliza, who was Katrina's sister. She settled in Florida, Palmetto. Um, Aunt Katrina came to visit us in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, we may have seen her once in New York. Um, we had no ties to Wilmington. We never went back to, I didn't even know that we, there would be a place to go back to. On my mother's side, those ties were in Pittsburgh and Virginia, and we would go to Virginia. So I think, you know, the, the, for as dramatic of a connection to a place and an event, um, as is obviously the case with my family in Wilmington, um, the, there, there weren't the normal kinds of connective tissue that, you know, would run through a grandparent to a parent to a child that would, um, you know, uh, be uh, front and center during family reunions or during holidays. Um, but because, um, and this may be characteristic of my, fa my father's family, um, you know, Katrina's brother, Uncle Joe, uh, who lived in Philadelphia, I never met Uncle Joe until Katrina died in the 1980s. Um, 
So, but he was living in Philadelphia that entire time. My father knew where he was. So, you know, I, I, every family has weirdnesses and odd dynamics that are hard to explain. But it, looking back, it is intriguing that there was no, uh, the, the, the connection to Wilmington seemed to have been either circumstantially or through some kind of you know, uh, in, intuitive distancing of family members from it, th there was no uh, carry through. There was nothing that was going to keep that, that memory alive. Um, and I, I, looking back, I, I, I regret it because I wish I knew more about, and the fact that I um, overlapped as an adult with, with three of the Yarborough children from that generation meant that they were there, they were available. Um, but no, there, there hasn't been any uh, conversation at all. My, my sisters know what I work on. They're curious, but, um, you know, the, it's a little obscure. It, again, because it's kind of a, a rarefied event uh, that is not as immediately um, present for them. Thank you. Um, uh, just because you've mentioned some of these other family members yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and, you know, we're, I think many of us who are here are, um, you know, really fascinated by your aunt Katrina and um, she of course was such a pioneer. Um, 1933, she becomes the, the first African-American opera singer to perform a leading role with an otherwise all white company. Um, she has, an incredible career in Europe that is unfortunately cut short because of World War II. Um, just the the reviews in the papers and and not just not just African American papers, you know, are are so laudatory. Um, and so it, sometimes that might you know blind us to the ways in which the Yarborough family as a whole was so accomplished. I mean, there were there were. And so I, I was just wondering if you could tell us, and of course, you know, you're a um, decorated professor, um, but if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the Yarborough family and how this was such a remarkable family of achievers. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, thank you. I mean, I, I, sometimes I wonder how far from the, if I, I was trying to say something about apple falling far from the tree and I'm not sure I'm gonna get it right. So I, I should X that comment. Um, you know, and, and, and I don't, yeah. I mean, one of the things that is clear is that um, regardless of um, anything else we know about that generation of Yarboroughs, and that is the first to John W. Yarborough, um, is that expectations and aspirations must have been very high. Um, you know, value placed on education, um, uh, hard work. Uh, one of the fascinating things that I they did was look through the Wilmington directories, which are in the library. And um, you know they list it, it's it, they list the residents of you know addresses and they list the occupations and um, it's clear that uh, a couple of the younger male Yarboroughs uh, Katrina's siblings uh, were sent to work early they were listed as boot blacks <laughs> um, you know which would have been something young black boys would have done um, it, it's. And, you know, the, the music lessons that uh, somehow they found the resources for, you know, in, in Katrina's case. Um, uh, Joe, um, when he left, uh, I don't know where he became educated. He became an engineer um, at a time where there were uh, not many <laughs> Black engineers. Um, he ended up working for the city of uh, Philadelphia. Um, Aunt Eliza, uh, you know, uh, went to New York City and uh, married someone in real estate and was fully a partner in the operations of uh, her, her family's properties. Um, you know, when she went down to Virginia, uh, to uh, Florida and settled um, at the age of 90, she was uh, running a volunteer programs for the elderly uh, uh, in the community. Uh, the elderly were, were anyone, was anyone who was 20 years younger than she was. Um, I think she went overseas on a trip in her 90s. Um, so, I mean, there was, I don't know where that comes from. I mean, there has to be something that, um, you know, from, from the parents and maybe from the community that um, uh, enables you to imagine um, and to feel that it's appropriate to aspire. Um, I mean, by the time, you know, it, it got to me, I mean, I'm very fortunate that, 
you know, my parents, like a lot of other, you know, black parents, you know, put tremendous weight on education. Um, and, you know, we, it was just expected. It, it, it was unacceptable not to, 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 to do that. And, um, you know, I don't know much about my father's father, uh, but he, 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 he was, I don't believe he was a white collar um, a professional. My father was a, was a, a, a postal carrier. Um, but he also also got into other um, uh, work, uh, uh, you know, became a real estate salesman. Um, you know, all these things I think go back to uh, what I mentioned in terms of the ability to not have one's imagination uh, foreclosed. And looking back, I do think indirectly being exposed to Aunt Katrina um, in particular um, made me realize that black folks can go to Europe, for example, <laughs> you know, that, that, you know, black people can perform, black people can be in the arts. Um, she just, it was just taken for granted that that, that was um, available. I might not have understood and appreciated what the music she was singing, but um, I knew it was serious and I knew that uh, it was a, 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 an amazing accomplishment. Um, so I think that those were some of the signals that may well go back generations. I mean, you know, I, I just don't want to suggest that, you know, um, those are prerequisites, um, but I think the, there must have been some kind of legacy of expectation that, and, and I also think um, from Katrina, the art, the arts. I know if my father were here and he could say how he would choose to have a life um, other than maybe the one he had professionally, he would have wanted to be in the arts somehow, in theater. Uh, he was just fascinated and obsessed. Um, it's one of the reasons I think he was so close to Aunt Katrina. Um, so yes, um, clearly those children were uh, empowered. And I think that that is a really impressive uh, uh, accomplishment on the part of the family and her parents. I just uh, I can't resist sharing this, um, if I can figure out how to do the screen share. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of all the um, articles and essays that I've that I've seen on um, on your on, on your ancestor, um, this is the only one I, I, I've seen that says anything about her Wilmington childhood, and it's yeah. kind of it's kind of startling. This this um, detail about Gregorian chants. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and so got a position in a, in a Catholic church is that, that, that surprised me too. I, I, um, I didn't know that she'd had a connection with the Catholic church. Yeah. Here. That... yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, I don't have it handy, but, uh, she attended, um, a parochial school in Wilmington for a time. Um, uh, as well as Gregory Norm, uh, Normal Institute. Um, and um, it also um, was the case, and just that clip you had, that little um, uh, clipping, uh, it says that her parents died and then she left. Um, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, her, her uh, father, I think he passed away in 1924 and she had left uh, Wilmington before uh, he passed away and her mother died in 1913. Um, so, um, uh, you know, there, there were, it's just um, the, the idea that she was, went north to live with relatives upon the death of her parents. I think it may have been her mother died and she, a year or two after that, went to Brooklyn actually. Um, and which, which raises another interesting coincidence, the fact that she went to Brooklyn and many of the African-Americans who fled Wilmington and the black Brooklyn community in Wilmington went to Brooklyn in New York City. Uh, that's where David Fulton uh, was writing from. So, you know, uh, how do you account for that particular you know, intersection? Um, but I think she was in her late teens when she went to uh, New York City, but it was, it was her father died after she had already gone and begun performing. Um, so I, it's fascinating to think about what the connection would have been between uh, John Yarbrough and Katrina after the passing of her mother. Um, 
and I know the it was the St. Thomas School, correct? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I've, I, I don't have these handy either, but the, um, I know that there are a number of interviews in which, um, you know, she, she will attribute some of her fond memories to, um, you know, or some of her inspiration to the Franciscan nuns yeah. and, and, yeah. She, and it's, it's, you know, it's very um, like before she's going to perform at the Hippodrome in 1933, she's, she's saying, well, by all, I'm, I'm not nervous at all, but I just want to do right by the nuns who, you know, who gave me some of that early training and, um, and, you know, she'll sometimes say that they had encouraged her to pursue her musical talents. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I don't know if this is a direct connection to the Catholicism or the, the Catholic training, but uh, I believe I saw one article where she d talks about uh, go when she went to Paris, um, that she caught the attention of someone uh, because she was singing in Catholic uh, churches and she was singing in Latin. Mm -hmm. um, now, I have to, I have to say, and I've said this every time I'm, I, I, I offer public comments about my aunt that um, my aunt made stuff up sometimes. Um, you know, she was not above. I think it's one reason there's several birth dates out there. Um, but uh, you know, so with a grain of salt. But I do think that the um, uh, the Catholic connection is a really interesting one, and it may relate to class. Uh, 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 status as well. I mean, I don't know if it was true in Wilmington, but in a number of, um, uh, particularly in the South, but elsewhere, I mean, uh, uh, Black Catholics uh, frequently uh, was, was, it was a sign of middle-class status. Um, so it's, it's interesting thinking about the number of Black denominations in Wilmington, uh, the various churches, and which church you attend and which denomination you're part of mattered and it did have class implications. And pre-Vatican II, it would make sense that, that it was that the chants were in Latin. Yes, um, oh yeah, right. oh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I remember Latin from, right. uh, I was raised in parochial school and it wasn't all the voice, I still remember the Latin. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get back, I, Les, I promised I, I would not forget about uh, your question um, about um, Katerina's experiences and treatment when she returned to Wilmington to perform um, at Thalian Hall. And, um, you know, I actually, I want to defer to Dr. Yarborough if this has come up for you at all, um, and then I can add to it. Yeah, I think I'd like to hear what you have to say. I know sure. she came back uh, and she performed in Raleigh, and she also came back to do a benefit for um, during the depression, and, and but I, I don't have any information about the reception. Yeah, um, so from the research that I've done, um, I've found three recitals at Thalian Hall um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, over 1932 to 1933. And um, in, in correspondence, Mary Alice Gervais Thatch has said how her father was really influential in helping to make that happen. Um, so, you know, I want to acknowledge his, um, his role as, as a leader in the Black community. Um, so I, if you'll excuse me for reading directly, um, so I have up here, um, this was from a notice in uh, the Baltimore Afro American mm -hmm. And this was from the first recital, the first homecoming recital that she gave. And this was um, either September 19th or 20th, 1932. And this was mm -hmm. shortly after she had returned to the, to the United States after her six years of European training. Mm -hmm. um, and the article is called Artist Thrills Home Folks. Mm -hmm. uh, 1400 Wilmingtonians of both races packed and jammed Thalian Hall Tuesday to welcome home and be thrilled by Madame Catherine Yarborough internationally known concert and opera star when she was presented in a concert. So uh, yeah. that's the one notice that I have, but you know, yeah. she was yeah. a big hit. Um, and then the, the second recital that she did was um, a benefit recital for the Wilmington Citizens Committee. And mm -hmm. this was um, Monday, October 3rd, 1932. Mm -hmm. And this was interesting. So the this is again a clipping from the Afro American, um, and the headline is Yarborough James Crow recital for North Carolina, um, and it reads uh, Catherine Yarborough, local soprano, who after appearing last year in the title role of Aida at Milan, Italy, returned to America as Katrina Yarborough. 
is scheduled to appear in a Jim Crow benefit recital at Thalian Hall on the night of October 3rd. The concert marks the second appearance of the singer here, she having been highly praised in a previous recital here on September 19th. At that time, half of the first floor was reserved for whites. Hmm. The arrangements for the coming concert, which is for the benefit of the treasury of the Wilmington Citizens Committee, provided that the entire first floor will be for whites only with Negroes limited to mezzanine and upper gallery seats. There is much dissension here over this proposed segregated arrangement and local leaders are anxiously waiting to see what citizens will subject themselves to mm. the Jim Crow arrangements. Mm. And then it goes on um, to, to say, you know, about the uh, details of, of the benefit concert. So yeah. I yeah. haven't found anything more, yeah. you know, about the circumstances of yeah. that, but, it, but it's just, I think it's really fascinating to see how, yeah. you know, yeah. her return, though greatly anticipated, is highlighting the divisions. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. And, and if, I mean, with both of those, uh, those recitals in 1932, that's before her big um, New York debut exactly. in 1933. So it, it, it's, it, it makes me think about or wonder what would have been the nature of the publicity? What, where, what would have established her reputation to come back to uh, Wilmington and, and be allowed to and encouraged to perform um, without the kind of attention that she received when she debuted in New York uh, at the Hippodrome? Uh, because this is a year before that. So it's just, it's, it's that transition from, uh, you know, the mystery years in Europe, I always thought of them with my, with my father. Uh, you know, we knew she was there, we, she could speak multiple languages, but the details of, you know, were just not, not, of it, not, not part of the menu. Uh, but, you know, she, she coming back um, and um, to home, to Wilmington, um, she must have already had a reputation of some kind. And it's just interesting thinking about the dynamics socially around uh, that concert. Yeah, I mean, and again, you're, you're totally right that it's, you know, the, the mystery years from, you know, the late uh, 1920s, you know, through then, you know, when she returns in, in 32, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have seen dispatches, you know, especially mm. in the African-American papers where it will be a little notice that, oh, we've gotten a, we've gotten a postcard from mm -hmm. Catherine Yarborough mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she's currently studying in France mm -hmm. and, um, and her, um, she, I believe she had won a big um, competition at the conservatory she was studying in um, at Milan. Wow. And then, so she then perf made this de debut in Aida and that was a, that was international news for yeah. sure. So yeah. I think, you know, she did have some, she had that international reputation mm -hmm. that then, you know, could help catapult things when she came back um, to the States. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, and then I wanted to share, um, I have an image of the, the recital program from mm -hmm. um let's see mm -hmm. this is for mm -hmm. yeah this is from the thalian hall recital that was mm -hmm. december of 1933 and this was after um she had then had her triumphant debut at the hippodrome um so that had been in in july of 1933 then this is december and so um i've just extracted these images uh with thanks to the cape fear museum mm -hmm. um and so this was a this was a publicity photo that shows up in a lot of papers, um, you know, with that quote from the New York Times impersonation of Verdi heroine by Katharina Yarbrough um, is vivid and vital. Mm -hmm. um, and so she, that's she has that publicity at that point um, from her American um, mm -hmm. operatic debut. And then um, and then we have this this program of and I don't. I haven't yet, this is work in progress. I haven't yet located um, any uh, reviews related to this concert, um, but I've been really struck, I've been really inspired right now by some some current scholarship in black opera studies. Um, and you know, I know Dr. Yarbrough is familiar with this, but there, there's incredible work that's being done by um, Dr. Lucy Kaplan, who's at Harvard and um, Dr. Naomi Andre, University of Michigan. Um, uh, Marva Griffin Carter um, and and many many others and um, and Stephanie Doctor as well and and one of the themes that has come up is how do we understand voice these lost voices 
where we don't have a recording. You know, we don't, we do not have an audio recording of what Yarborough's voice um, was like, especially, you know, certainly not um, in its prime. Um, and, um, and then at the same time, you know, how can we perhaps look at the programming that they were doing and, you know, thinking about the Du Bois uh, uh, concept of double consciousness and thinking about um, signifying, like, are there ways in which the pieces that are on the program might potentially carry double meanings? And um, so, uh, you know, something that, and this might seem far-fetched, so I'm kind of, I'm curious to hear if you think I'm, I'm crazy about this, um, but, a lot of the, the the texts of the of the songs that were on this program um, dealt in themes related to um, homeland or nostalgia. Um, the very first song that Donati is about a beloved image um, or an image of the beloved that doesn't quite match up with with the image that once existed. Um, Mon pays, of course, um, my my native land or my country. Um, Ritorna Vincitor from Aida is all about this, this tension um, between love and duty and, and a conflicted sense of homeland. Um, and then yeah, on the second half of the, of the program, um, it, it opens with, with the song Hunger by Turner Layton. And she was, she was so important in um, advocating for repertoire by African-American composers, not just spirituals but but art songs and so we have this this piece um hunger and the the text for it is um it has to do with themes of crucifixion and persecution um and then closing out the program with were you there um it just it, given given some of the racial dynamics that were raised by these segregated concerts that she that that she was performing for in wilmington and um, given the legacy of 1898, um, there's a part of me that that just wonders if there might have been a a double consciousness, a, a signifying in which these songs may have served as an indictment of some of the white audience members. Boy, uh, yeah, it, um, sure. I mean, just it, it that makes sense to me. I mean, you know the artistic choices, what resonates emotionally um, with a given artist, um, you know, um, it, it's, it's hard to, you know, uh, tease out, uh, but she was uh, an extremely, an ex how could she not be? She was an extremely proud woman um, and uh, uh, very assertive, um, you know, and uh, you know, really, almost over overpoweringly so. Um, you know, she she there was not much air left in the room when she walked in. Um, so the the possibility that that you know, either consciously or maybe a, a kind of mix in terms of you know the the affective work that certain kind of creative choices might represent. Uh, I think that yeah, I mean, I think that some of her uh, choices may actually resonate with you know, um, real kind of the emotional side of her uh, singing where she's singing. I mean, can you imagine, you know, what, you know, she was feeling being at home? Um, and, you know, I'm sure there were people in the audience that, that she grew up knowing and maybe even fearing, um, you know, we don't know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there has had to have been a lot of complex uh, emotional, um, you know, conscious dynamics and maybe even unconscious dynamics um, behind the performance, behind the choices. Thank you. Um, thanks for not saying I'm crazy. Well, I mean, I am crazy, but you know, in this regard, maybe maybe there's something there. Um, I wanted to get back to the the chat. I know a lot of things have come in while I was um, pontificating. Um, yeah, uh, Jim Jim Downey had a had a question that I didn't want to get lost about um, the possibility that Katerina had Native American ancestry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know this is listed um, in a number of uh, reference texts, um, and um, the short answer is I, I she may have had um, Native American ancestry, but it it would not have been. 
um, I think that observation can be made about many, 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 many African American families uh, from North Carolina who, who, if they've been there several generations. Um, I've also seen online or in some publications uh, the idea that her mother, um, uh, Eliza, was uh, Native American or uh, you know indigenous, and it, it's nothing that I've come across. Uh, 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 suggested that that was true. Now, again, that doesn't mean there may not have been some uh, American Indian ancestry, but it was not that dramatic. I mean, it was not, you know, such that uh, you would, um, you know, consider her parents to be Black and Native um, uh, 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 in an interracial marriage of any kind. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, and also this isn't the only Black family where um, you know, there's there's there, there's conversation of some kind about Native American, uh, uh, some kind of Native American lineage, uh, but I, I don't think it's correct to to identify uh, Katrina's mother, John W's uh, 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 wife, as as Native American. Um, I do think uh, it, uh, my um, uncle, uh, Uncle Joe, once in a while referenced. The possibility. I mean, he even before the question of uh, you know uh, Katrina's uh, father. Uh, so it, it it it's not coming out of nowhere. I think that the ref any references were made to it. It's just that I think how it's framed is not accurate. It, it could also be worth mentioning in a in a Wilmington context that so often when people spoke about Native Americans or American Indians, they were referring to um, the group of people who, who live um, in, uh, near Lumberton, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. now identify as, as Lumbee Indians. Mm -hmm. um, and their, their um, ethnic and racial identity could, could be very um, uh, metamorphic, you know, mm -hmm. depending on the social mm -hmm. situation. And, and I know there are other um, sort of found black families here in Wilmington, including the Sajwars who mm -hmm. claim Native American ancestry and are probably correct about it. But, mm -hmm. but the um, particular tribe that the, that the blood flows down from, you know, a, a person could never, could never identify it. Yeah, yeah. And in, um, I don't think this applies to uh, Katrina's parents, but, you know, and maybe, uh, this had been known before in, by historians, I just hadn't been tracking it. But in uh, Wilmington's Lie, the author um, points out that um, one of the leading black lawyers in Wilmington, uh, Henderson, um, was actually Native American, but uh, identified as black and lived as black. Um, so I, I, again, I don't know how widely that fact was known, uh, but it, it just suggests minimally how complicated it is to talk about race as a stable category <laughs> in situations like this. Um, uh, when, uh, yeah, the, let me stop there. But you know, I, I, if one of the think challenges when I start doing this work online is um, uh, trying not to feel compelled to, to somehow correct in some of the mythology about uh, Katrina. Uh, when I encountered it um, uh, in clippings or in, because, you know, and I've encountered this in other work, once it gets out there, then it gets picked up and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, and it becomes hard to run it to ground, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, I, I do, I'm, I'm skipping ahead to one of the more recent questions. And so I, I will get back to some of the others, but um, a question just because it's sort of like, uh, this is a question I think is somewhat related in terms of clarifying, you mm -hmm. know, setting the record straight, um, reconciling the the difference between Yarbor Jarborough yeah. and, and Yarborough. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was trying to, you know, in anticipation of this, I tried to like remember throw my mind back to when I was a child. For some reason, I don't remember being confused by the fact that Aunt Katrina, um, her last name was spelled differently than my name. I mean, I don't know why that didn't, you know, cause me some, I don't know, cognitive dissonance or something. Um, you know, maybe there were enough weird things going on in my family. This, this was just another one. Um, but she talks in, um, 
a number of interviews that she changed her name in Italy um, and that um, it was, I believe, for ease of pronunciation. Um, I actually had thought before I um, saw her comments that um, it had something to do definitely with her time in Europe. Um, for example, in, in, in Germany, if, you know, to pronounce her name with the J would give you the ya sound. Um, so it was a kind of phonetic um, uh, 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 revision of the spelling of her name. Um, but it was it, it, clearly it was part of uh, adapting to the um, linguistic and cultural environment. But I think it was also, this may be too easy of a kind of pop psychologizing, but you know, I, I was only half joking about the idea of self-creation. I mean, you know, uh, you know, you change your name and you come back and it means that your identity has been revised in some fundamental ways. Um, you know, she's, she's not coming back to Wilmington as Catherine Lee Yarbrough. She's coming back to Wilmington as the diva Katrina Yarbrough, although, um, you know, it also was frustrating because people would insist on pronouncing her name once she came back Jarborough with the, with the hard J. Um, but yeah, it was her, her, her explanation was that it was to adapt to phonetic practices um, in, in the European communities where she found herself. Um, and I don't remember if we've talked about this previously, but um, when I was trying to find, you know, record of um, her, like the role that she had played in Shuffle Along, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, as well as, so when she's then in the sequel, Run and Wild mm -hmm. um, in 1923, she's credited there as Catherine Yarborough, but then- yeah. Yeah. But then I'm going through all these programs from Shuffle Along, and I'm I'm not finding her. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I, I I I kept seeing the name Dorothy Yarburg, Y A R B U R G. Mm -hmm. uh. And then I eventually came across, and it was in the, and then I and then I came across another program that said Catherine Yarburg. Huh. And it's I mean it's got it's it's yeah. her, you know, absolutely. And and this yeah. Dorothy and Catherine. And Yarberg, they're always in the same mm -hmm. um, the same yeah. uh, position within the list of the happy yeah. honeysuckles and shuffle yeah. along. And so that that to me says, you know, she's already experimenting with a, some kind of stage persona and and self creation. Um, and I don't, you know, I do you have more to say too about you know the, this motif of renaming in mm -hmm. the black community? Yeah, um, you know it. It, 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 and it, it goes back a long, long way. Um, you know, uh, it goes back to, you know, formerly enslaved when, you know, they became free. Frederick Bailey became Frederick Douglass. Um, you know, he wasn't born Frederick Douglass. He, he chose that name. Uh, and then later, you know, Malcolm Little becomes Malcolm X. You know, Lou Alcindor becomes Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, you know, the, the, this idea of, and, and, you know, it's not exclusive to African-Americans. It's just that I think the issue of identity um, an issue of having forced identities on you, especially in terms of language. Um, I'm, I suspect people in the audience may remember the first episode of Roots, the TV show where, you know, Kunta Kinte is being beaten because he won't respond to the name Toby, the, the, Ameri the English name. Um, so naming is, is very, very charged with significance um, uh, all around identity and autonomy uh, within African-American community. So it is fascinating thinking about her um, you know, exper experimenting is the right word. And, you know, really trying to figure out who she's going to make herself into. Um, for Kathleen's question, um, have you found any newsreels featuring Katrina, which may have supported her return to Wilmington and or performing in the United States? I have not. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I'd had, um, uh, I would have I would have shown them, you know, right here. Um, I have now a couple of students and colleagues who th there is some really fascinating work now being done on the African American arts community in Italy. Um, the focus is primarily on post World War II, and it turns out there was a major um, settlement of African Americans and Blacks from elsewhere in the diaspora in Rome uh, in the uh, post war years. Uh, and even though Paris gets all the publicity, um, there were many, many Black artists, singers, performers, actors uh, in Rome uh, 
uh, in the, the mid, mid 20th century. And one of the things that that has triggered is a number of, re of researchers going overseas who have the language capacity to go through the Italian archives. And, you know, when, when I feel like I can't control myself, I'm going to ask a audience. And I have a colleague who, as um, soon as the COVID shutdown ends, is on a postdoctoral fellowship in Rome. Um, I'm going to ask her if she has a moment to do some uh, searching, uh, even if it's just online, uh, in uh, the, the Italian archives for uh, notices about Katrina. But I think that that will be um, an opening up of uh, a, a, the archive I was talking about that maybe have gaps in the United States, but you know we shouldn't take for granted that those gaps exist overseas. We just haven't done the digging yet. Um, Tiffany has a really fabulous question. Um, how do we situate Yarbrough vis-a-vis -vis, um, Marian Anderson and Leontine Price? Is this even possible without audio recordings of Yarbrough's voice? Um, I'm, I, if I may kind of pop in, I, you know, I want to oh, emphasize sure. that, you know, Marian Anderson and and Katrina Yarbrough were contemporaries. I think Anderson was born only one year earlier. Um, and they were, but it was very much a matter of timing um, mm -hmm. because Anderson was a contralto and Yarbrough was a dramatic soprano. And so um, even though there was so much um, energy being, you know, an activism um, being put towards uh, integrating the Metropolitan Opera, um, there it was not even remotely possible until the early 1950s. And it was not even um, entertained. Um, and um, I have, you know, and it's, I have some letters from the Met archives from the from 1933 and 1936, where um, the president of the board is writing to the general manager saying, do we want to consider giving her an audition? Or do we want to consider letting Yarbrough um, maybe give a benefit recital on the Met stage for Fisk University? And, you know, and it always, it never comes to anything. Um, she was, she was finally granted an audition in 1951. But it, again, at this point, as a dramatic soprano, yeah. she is, you know, she's 20 years past her prime and, um, or, you know, almost 20 years past her prime. And so the, the description on her audition card um, says, intelligent artist with experience, some very good top notes, rather shaky middle range and no piano. Not for us, except possibly chorus. And, you know, so we just, we'll never know, you know, what might have been possible had the timing been different. Anderson, because she was a contralto, um, she could be cast in a role that even though she too was past her prime, um, when she sang Ulrika in um, Verdi's Trovatore, Ulrika really just has this one aria. Um, it's more of a character role. Um, and so she could, she could be featured and the Met could kind of pat themselves on the back for, uh, you know, for having then had um, a black singer performing a named role with them. But, um, you know, for a dramatic soprano, um, you know, by the, by the time it's, by the time it even became possible, it, she, you know, it was a, it's, it's really a tragedy. I mean, it's a, it's this great missed opportunity. Um, I, I did bring along um, a recording. Uh, it's not of um, it's not of Catherine Yarbrough, of course, but it's of a really fabulous dramatic soprano, Jamisa Yarbrough, um, from North Carolina. Um, and I had mentioned earlier how, in the absence of audio recordings, it it's it, it can be difficult to to really appreciate fully what these lost voices sounded like. And, you know, I'm not by any means saying Jamisa's voice equals what, uh, you know, your aunt Katrina's voice was like, but in terms of the repertoire that they're singing, um, it, it gives us an idea of, of what kind of a voice, what kind of, um, what kind of weight, what kind of um, projection, um, what kind of dramatic power they would have had to, um, be capable of. And so um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, Before you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Lost the song. I, I just was curious. How is it that she that she was not recorded? I mean, that, that's that's strange, even for the period. And, um, you know. 
Do we know anything about that? I know she was on the radio a couple of times, but um, I don't know if those were, I don't, I don't think that those were recorded or I haven't been able to locate any kind of archival um, trace. Yeah, I've, I've never seen one either. I just, yeah. it's just okay. occurring. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I think that it would be interesting in, to, to look at the history of recording of black classical music singers. Um, you know, it, uh, and also it, it, I, I, you know, fantasy, uh, I wonder if she may have recorded in Europe um, and, you know, because of the war, um, you know, and the, we just don't have access to the, that. Mm. So yeah, some opportunities for um, future research directions. Mm -hmm. um, we're almost so, um, we're we're almost at the hour and a half mark. And, I know. Uh, I just really want to play this song. Well, no, no, I was going to say, I wonder if we shouldn't go out on this. Maybe we should. Oh. Um, maybe we should go ahead and say good night, and then have this song as a last. You know, we can we can uh, go out thinking about about Katerina and her voice. Absolutely. So um, this is this is an aria um, from Debussy's cantata L'Enfant Prodigue or the, the Prodigal Son. And this is um, sung by Leah, the, the mother of um, the Prodigal Son, Azael. And um, this this was in Yarbrough's repertoire, particularly when she was in Europe, um, when she was she performed this um, in Paris. Um, so, you know, this is one way in which this this is this was a signature piece for Katerina Yarborough, and so we get an idea of the kind of dramatic repertoire um, that that her voice was capable of. And um, again, I'm not equating Jamisa with um, with Katerina, but um, Jamisa's uh, an astounding uh, soprano, and so it gives us perhaps some sense. Helena, I, I want to thank you, and, and why don't we all um, take a moment to give to give a Zoom applause to Dr. Yarborough for for joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation, and it's been a great conversation. I hope uh, hope it's not the last one. We hope not too. It was it was really fascinating to listen to you. Thank you. <laughs>